morning, everybody. That uh, I want you to kind of keep that image of those two sisters looking at each other and singing. And I just want you to think of the word correspondence, how they corresponded to each other and were corresponding to each other. I just want you to hold on to that as we go through the message today. Uh, this being Easter Sunday, I have a tie and a coat on, <clears throat> and uh, next Sunday will be different. Uh, but in honor of Jesus Christ, I, resurrection, I put a tie and a coat on on Easter Sunday, and it feels strange uh, to have on. I had to go find a tie in my closet somewhere there. I knew I had one somewhere. And uh, if for communion, just let me remind everybody, uh, the little cups when you come in during the pandemic, we've been using these. Uh, so you just peel the top off for the bread, and uh, then you can peel the bottom off, tip it over, and peel the bottom off for the cup. And after the message is over, we'll be taking the Lord's Supper. So uh, you're invited as a believer to participate with us in the Lord's Supper. Just you can be a little bit more ready of what's going to happen at that time. Uh, we're in a series um, called How Do We Make Sense of This World? There's been so many things happening uh, in our world, in our own nation, that have just kind of thrown us off the rails a little bit. And it just raises lots of questions in our minds. And the, the big one is, how do we just make sense of this world right now? And today I want to talk on Easter Sunday about what do people really long for? And of course, the short and easy answer would be love. That we're, deep down, we all just want to be loved. The Beatles sang so long ago, all you need is love. But people since that time have been asking them, what kind of love? We only have one word for love in English, but we have all different kinds of meanings for love. There's romantic love and tough love and sacrificial love. There's erotic love. There's the love of a, of a good friend. There's a love of a good book. There's the kind of love where you desire something like pizza. And there's the kind of love where you appreciate something like pizza. Which one of those loves is it the one that you really long for? And how do you find it? Where do you get it? I think the truth is that most of us kind of walk through life with a, with a kind of vague, foggy notion of what it is we really are longing for in life. We're so busy doing life that we can't take the time to kind of unravel the knot and figure out what it is that we really long for. Consider these words by the composer Leonard Bernstein. I think it's from his musical called The Mass. He says, what I need, I don't have. What I have, I don't own. What I own, I don't want. What I want, Lord, I don't know. Kind of typifies how a lot of people might feel. The reason that this whole thing can be so confusing is that we are being bombarded all of the time with messages and images offering us their solution to our longings. Google and Amazon and Facebook and all the others, they have made a considerable study of you. And I mean you, the individual. They know exactly what time of day that you will most likely make a certain kind of decision. They know what time of day and what day of the week and whatever that you might actually purchase something. And those ads that pop up in emails and those ads that pop up on your phone and the ads that pop up when you're reading the news, those are all specifically designed for you, the individual. We've never had to deal with that before. We have never lived under that kind of persuasive salesmanship where they, in a, in a sense, know more about us and our buying habits than we even keep track of ourselves. Maybe we're not as free in, in our decision-making as we think we are sometimes. 
Now this last year, we have been battling the COVID pandemic. Hopefully we're coming out of it. Now it's time to be really diligent that we don't slip backwards because we really want to clear this thing up. But during this last year, we have experienced restrictions upon our freedoms. We have been confined to our homes. Our choices have been restricted. Our freedoms have been limited. But think for a moment about how other people in history have experienced that same thing. Think about the people of God living as slaves in Egypt for 400 years, where their, where their freedom was tremendously restricted, obviously, slaves. The choices of work were being made for them. They didn't get to make any of those choices. Literally, generations died in slavery. Or think of the people of God who were taken off to Babylon in exile and they lived in exile away from Jerusalem for 70 years. 70. The Bible says they hung up their musical instruments. They just hung them up because there's no joy and they don't feel like singing. How many times this year did you feel like not singing? You know, just feeling your restrictions of freedom. When they came back to Jerusalem, you know, there's this coming back to normal. And we talk about that a lot. But when they came back to Jerusalem, the walls were torn down and needed to be rebuilt. The houses in Jerusalem needed to be completely rebuilt and people had to be chosen who would move into the homes. All the time their enemies were trying to destroy their progress. They came back to Jerusalem to worship and their worship just wasn't the same. And so here we are coming out of this pandemic and we're just so anxious for things to return to normal. But how normal is the stuff we're going to experience? I mean, think of a prisoner who's been locked up for several years, one year, three years, 15 years, whatever, and then is released. And all this time, they're, you know, they're looking forward to getting back to normal. Well, will that prisoner experience normal? Imagine in that 10 year period of time, how banking has changed. How's it changed in the last couple of years? How shopping at a supermarket has changed. How to use that self-checkout thing? How has your phone service changed? How has medicine changed? You, you talk to the doctor on your computer now? Think of somebody coming back to something like that and how different it would be. Or like a soldier on a long deployment or a soldier gone off to war looking forward to getting home again. What is home going to be like? And when the soldier finally arrives, the kids have grown some, haven't they? And has that war or that deployment changed the soldier? How do they re-enter? What do they have to go through? What lessons have they learned about their life and their soul? And what has their family been learning and how they bring it all back together again? So we just don't walk out of a pandemic back into normal. We have lessons to learn from our past experiences. And we have things to learn today as we come back to what we hope is something more normal. Now here we are gathered together in this room on an Easter Sunday morning. And Easter reminds us of just how different things are when God shows up. Because Easter and the resurrection signal a new beginning. You know, in the world, the only thing that really is normal is change. In the world, hope is just wishful thinking. I sure hope it turns out that way. And you just kind of wishful thinking. But for a Christian, hope is based on the fact of the resurrection. That's different. Because the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. The power that restricted freedom, the power that confined has been broken. So now, now we begin to emerge from this pandemic and I want to encourage you this morning to use this time to focus on some of the things that are unchangeable, 
Some of the things that are always there and always consistent. The things in life that we long for, we truly long for these things. But I think it's all like we develop cultural cataracts, you know, and we, can't, we just don't see it all clearly. And those cultural cataracts have to be removed so we can see clearly. And that's what I want for you today. I want you to see each one of these five things I'm going to share with you. And I want you to see them clearly. I want you to be able to take this Easter Sunday morning and use this Sunday morning as a day to say, something new in my life is happening right now. Something change, some change can happen that's really positive in my life today. And I want you to be able to look at the pandemic and say, I can emerge from this a different person, not just better, kind of like a brand new person. For each of these five things, I'm going to share kind of a checklist question, a commitment. And I'm going to ask you this morning to make some big commitments. And the reason I want to ask for big commitments is because your commitments shape your life. Your life is always being shaped by the commitments you make. As soon as you get married and you say yes to this person, that commitment has said no to all these other ones. Because commitments always shape your life. Now, let's look at these five things. Number one, people are longing for someone to believe in. Most of our problems in our society today boil down to the twin issues of faith and trust. People don't believe other people. People don't trust other people right now. And why? Because we're not listening to each other. We're not talking. There's a lot of shouting. There's a lot of blaming. There's a lot of conflict. But is anybody hearing what the other person is saying? If you're not listening and you're not hearing, there never will be faith. And without faith, there never will be trust. So the big question of our life is, who are you really going to believe? Why are they so trustworthy? The media is accused of being biased. Quotes get manipulated. Images get photoshopped. And communication seems to always require a spin doctor. And we look at all this confusion, and then deep down, deep down we are still people who long to believe in someone and really trust someone. We really do. We're just hardwired to believe and to trust. But today we have created what they're now calling a cancel culture. And if someone fails you or wrongs you or disappoints you, you cancel them. If that movie actor did that one wrong thing, no more movies for you, canceled. If that politician did something, no more in politics, you have to resign, you're canceled. And we've created this cancel culture where we just write somebody off if they've hurt us or done something wrong. Listen, if you write everybody off who's done wrong, you've written everybody off. And if you canceled everybody out of your life, who are you gonna believe? Let's put it on the back of Christians a little bit. Christians are criticized for being hypocritical. Been going on for years and years and years. They've been criticized for not really practicing, not really putting out there what they preach. I learned a lesson many years ago. And it was about putting my art into galleries for sale. Because if you've got a painting that's hanging in a gallery for months and months and months and somebody else is selling, you get pretty discouraged. And you begin to wonder, well, okay, what's wrong? And here's the lesson I learned. The problem is not with the collectors who are coming into the gallery. The problem is with the painting. And you have to buck it up and don't blame the collector and start looking at your art and maybe doing something differently. And I think the lesson applies to Christians. Let's take this one in on ourselves. 
And let's say rather than reacting against the critics of Christianity, they slam you, you slam them back, cancel, cancel. Let's not do that. I think it would be better if we take the criticism and ask ourselves, is there something I'm missing? Is there something I'm not doing that would make a difference? Put it on myself. Proverbs 15.32 says, he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. They get smarter. Notice also that I said, we all long for someone to believe in. I didn't say something. I did not say something to believe in. Because I think this is where the popular misunderstanding of Christianity has gone awry. Or this is the, anyway, this is where it all gets screwed up. That's not in my notes, but that's, this is the problem. Because people perceive Christianity just to be another lifestyle choice made up of your moral rights and wrongs, and I have my lifestyle choice made up of my moral rights and wrongs, and I fight my morality against your morality, let's have a value war, let's all fight each other. And we're not getting anything from it. And the misunderstanding, the misunderstanding over here on the Christian side is that maybe we're communicating the wrong thing. Maybe what we're really putting out there as Christians is like a bad painting and nobody's buying it. We have made the whole thing into a religion rather than a relationship. We have made the doctrine more important than the teacher. We've made the book more holy than the author. In other words, Maybe we've taken the gospel and we have taken this good news and we've packaged it up into a nice, neat little system of indoctrination. And then we, got to, we put people in the box and if their legs stick out, we cut them off. And we've got to put people in this box. And the problem with this whole thing is, as soon as you start to create a system, it enslaves you. That's the problem with systems. They enslave you. You can't get out of the box. What really makes someone a Christian is very simple. It is their belief that Jesus of Nazareth is the unique son of God. That he is the promised Messiah. And that he is the Lord of all creation and their personal life. That makes you a Christian. Because Christianity is all about Jesus. Not a body of doctrine. It's not a set of morals. It's a person. No Jesus, no Christianity. That's the significance of the resurrection. And our unity is in the person of Jesus Christ. Not in a system of doctrines about him. And not in our present understanding of him, because if it's a, a journey towards Jesus on the same road, he's the way, you're going to have a different understanding of some doctrine than I have. But it's not the difference of our understandings of a certain doctrine that divide us. What unites us is the person of Jesus. The poet John Oxingham wrote a poem called Credo one time. Let me share it. Not what, but whom I do believe, that in my darkest hour of need has comfort that no mortal creed to mortal man may give. Not what, but whom, for Christ is more than all the creeds, and his full life of gentle deeds shall all the creeds outlive. Not what I do believe, but whom, who walks beside me in the gloom, who shares the burden wearisome, who all the dim way doth illume, and bids me look beyond the tomb, the larger life to live. Not what I do believe, but whom, not what, but whom. We were created to enjoy a relationship with God. That's the whole point of life. And there is something inside of us that just longs for that relationship. It's a, it's a deep desire for home. It's a desire that's inside of all of our souls to really belong somewhere, to be a part of it. 
and it's a longing for someone to believe in, someone in whom we can completely trust. Checklist question. Have you committed your life to Jesus Christ as Lord of all life? Do you believe he's the unique son of God? Checklist. Make the commitment. Second thing that I think people are looking for is a purpose that truly shapes their lives. A purpose that really shapes their life. Because I believe that everybody born in the world has a unique purpose from God. Isaiah 49.1 says, The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. Galatians 1.15 says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace. You see, no matter how you came into this world, whether you never knew your birth mother or you grew up in an abusive, strict parents or you were the product of somebody else's violence, God was still there in your mother's womb knitting you together, making you unique, special. And he, from the mother's womb, has desired you. And he has a design for you. And that love and that design never changes regardless of the circumstances of life. You have been chosen and God is calling you. If you have a piece of paper there, write down the word design. And let me just go through this. If you've never been through this before, let me just share it with you real quickly. The D in design stands for a dream. Some people might call it a passion. But there is something in you that is special and unique to you. It's a, it's a fire that you feel. It's a, there's an issue that you see on the news and it gets you stirred up. It's a desire that you have that just builds in you. It's an ideal that you have, an ideal that you follow. There's something about you that really pulls you. And you find yourself coming back to it all the time. It's your, your dream. The E stands for experiences. And we all have a whole bunch of different experiences in life. We have good experiences, we have bad experiences. We have the experiences from our school days. We have experiences from friendships. We have experiences we've gained in marriage. We've had experiences that we've gained at work. We all have experiences, good ones and bad ones. God never wastes your experiences. He's got something for us to learn from our bad experiences. He's got something good for us to enjoy in our good experiences. There's lessons in all of them. So don't forget your experiences. The S stands for spiritual gifts. When you become a Christian, God sort of places upon you or gives to you certain gifts. He may give you one. He may give you many gifts. You might have the gift of teaching. You might have the gift of administration. You might have the gift of encouragement. You might have the gift of hospitality. You might have the gift of mercy and helps. You might have the gift of service. But you've got some gift. God has given it to you. The I stands for individual personality. You know, you, you, you have two or three kids in your family and you look at them and watch them. They're just not the same. I was talking to a friend of mine about my daughters and my, my daughter, Christina. She's, I think, four years old. We're sitting at the dining room table. And she's the strong-willed child, you know, just admittedly so. And she announces at dinner, when I grow up, I'm going to be a policeman. It's right out of the blue. And I said, why do you want to be a policeman? And she said, well, because you can tell people what to do. It was just clear to her. And I said, well, you know, that's a good job. Need a job. You know, so maybe you will be. You know, we just had a conversation. Went on with dinner. And she stops again. And she's got this thought. You could tell in her face. And she said, maybe I'll be president. Let's ramp it up a little bit. 
I'll be president. I said, well, maybe so. You know, you're my daughter, go for it. You know, uh, and then she gets this look on her face and I just stopped her. And I said, no, now, now, Christina, God is God. And he runs the universe, you don't, okay? Let's just, good time at dinner time here to kind of settle that question. What's your personality like? Are you the strong-willed child? You know, you, are you the one you know, who wants to get everybody together, get a bunch of squirt guns and go put out the fires of hell? You know, is, is that your ambition? Is that you're just that kind of a leader? Are you the extrovert or the introvert? That, that all depends on where you get your energy. An extrovert is re-energized from being with people. An extrovert is with people, likes it, but wants to go home pretty soon and just rest. You know. uh, so which one are you? G of design stands for growth. That's your maturity level. Where, at, where are you at in Christ? Are you a baby in Christ, a toddler in Christ? Have you been running a long time with Christ? Where is your spiritual level of maturity? And the N stands for natural abilities. Because people's abilities differ. Some people have tremendous abilities in mathematics and other people don't. Some people have abilities with computer and technology and other people don't. People have ability with music, other people don't. Computers, others not. Where are your natural abilities? Knowing how God has designed you can change your life. So do you know your design? Checklist question. Make a commitment to discover your design and fulfill it. That's a big commitment. And make a big commitment in your life to discover that design and fulfill it. Here's the third, third thing I think people are longing for. And that is people to do life with. People to do life with. God never intended that anybody live alone. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about marriage. Paul was the apostle and he was single. And he never even sought to be married, as far as we know. But he had all these friendships and all these relationships and he had a lot of people around him to do life with. When it comes right down to it, that's what God wants for a church. He wants the church to be a community, a family, where people are really seriously doing life together, figuring it out. New Testament talks about it very clearly. Ephesians chapter 2 from the Message Bible it says, you belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here. If, stop right there. And if I asked everybody in this room, how did you ever get the church? And we'd all have different answers. The influence of different people, the invitation to somebody, you know, a pressure from somebody a little bit, maybe like, you know, we're not going to go to dinner and have that special dinner unless, you know, whatever it was that got you here, you're here. Whatever made you belong to a church was different for everybody. So irrespective of how you got here, God is using you all in what he is building. It goes on. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds everything together. And when he's talking about stones and bricks in a building, he's talking about the biblical image of the temple. 1 Peter 2, 5. You also are like living stones. I love these words. So let yourselves be used. Those are great words. God can't use you unless you let yourself be used. So let yourself be used. Make yourself available to God to build up a spiritual temple. That's what the New Testament church is, the new temple. To be holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices to God. He will accept those sacrifices through Jesus Christ. You see, in this unique design of you, there is something that you have to contribute to the church and to the world that only you have to contribute. And how much we're missing in this world if you don't know your design and you don't know 
how to make yourself available to God. I think people want to belong to a community where they feel loved. Problem is a lot of times in a church, they didn't really experience genuine love, so they left. They want to feel like they can belong to a place that really accepts them the way they are, because that's what the Bible says, God begins where we are. He doesn't say now, before you can be baptized, or before you can be a, a Christian, you need to get that problem in your life straightened out. You need to stop doing this bad habit. No, God says, come on, let's get started. That's acceptance. And you need a place where you're forgiven. Because we all blow it. And we need a place where we're forgiven, not canceled. We need a place where we feel hope and help and a real feeling of home. Checklist question. Have you made a commitment to be a part of a church family? God designed us this way. God designed it. Not just me talking. Number four, what are people looking for? I think they're looking for a cause bigger than themselves. A cause bigger than self. Because despite all of our brokenness and all of our tragedies and all of our sad stories, people are still longing for genuine love. Because love is at the heart of what it really means to be human. The Bible says God is love. He's the real artist who created the whole universe. But he's so much more than that when the Bible says he's love. He's not the sum total of all knowledge. and He's not the perfect conclusion of a mathematical equation. He is love. It's his essence. And you and I are made in his image. We correspond to God. That's why I asked you to watch the faces of those two sisters as they sang. There's more than just family connection. There's something going on when they're singing and they just so perfectly are corresponding to each other. And our relationship with God ought to look like that. Where we feel so in love with him that that correspondence is happening face to face. And in order to have that love, you have to lose yourself in something greater. You cannot find the love you're looking for by just getting it and gaining. It comes through giving. And that kind of love doesn't mean that you lose your identity if you're investing yourself in a cause greater than yourself. Some people think that's what it means to be a Christian. You just have to give up being you. Well, it could be further from the truth. Why would God create you in your mother's womb with this unique identity and design and then say, now you have to give all that up? No. You have to be that person. Genuine love means you find your true self when you live and give yourself for something greater than yourself. Jesus said in Matthew 16, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, You'll find it. You discover your true self when you give yourself to something greater. Jesus also said that we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In his world and most of the world today, the purpose of salt is to keep the meat or the fish from rotting. Light, the Bible says, makes it possible for us to see. If you've been in a, a cave and been spelunking and you turn all the lights off down deep inside of a cave and you're in true, total darkness, it's freaky. It's freaky because there's no ambient light, there's no starlight, there's no street lights, there's nothing. It's pitch dark. And light makes it possible for us to see. Both salt and light teach us the doctrine of expendability. Because both salt and light expend themselves in doing what they were designed to do. 
the salt dissolves and disappears into the meat. And the candle or the light bulb expends itself, giving light until it's done. The Bible says King David served God in his generation and then he died. That's life. We serve God in our generation and then we die. We expend ourselves. And as the church, God put us here to expend ourselves for the sake of the world. It's not for us. If it was just for you, he'd take you immediately to heaven. But he leaves you here because there's a mission. Here's a question. Just for you personally. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you think you're really doing, really honestly, truly doing with the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Scale of 1 to 10. Do you see how having a purpose that shapes your life and having a, having a cause bigger than yourself, how they go together? You see, God isn't asking you to be the Savior or the Messiah of the world. That's Jesus' job. He was the one who died for the sins of the whole world. He's not asking you to do that. You may say, well, I'm going to give myself unreservedly to God, and I know what's going to happen. He's going to have me go to some foreign country, and I'm going to have to make a drink soup that's made with snakes and spiders. You know? And I can't do that. We imagine the worst. Well, he's not going to do that. If he designed you in the womb for a certain reason to live, and you've got this God-given design, and you make yourself available, as Peter says, just make yourself available to God, you're going to find him giving you things that perfectly fit you, that light your fire and get you going. If it's draining to you all the time, that's not a part of your design. Look for it someplace else. Now, that's not to say that doing your design is hard. It can be hard. It's not always easy. Life's not easy. But I'm talking about saying, oh, I know this is me. I would get up every morning and do this. That's you. Are you committed to expend yourself for Christ? To give yourself to something greater than yourself? Have you made that commitment? Last one, number five. I think people are longing for a sense of contentment. A real, true sense of contentment. I think if you ask most people, what do you really want out of life? What are we going to say? Happy. Just want to be happy. People want to feel content. People want to go home and they want to feel safe and they want to feel satisfied with the day's work. Right now, after what we've been through as a nation, we are seeing a migration of thousands and thousands of people leaving major cities and moving to rural areas. It's really amazing. If I saw the demographics on a map and they came from east and west coast big cities and it goes right into the middle of the country from Texas all the way up to South Dakota, all of that migration. Why? Because the chaos that they've been living in is too much and they want some contentment. They want their kids to grow up in a place where they just feel basically safe. I mean, it's a longing. But what happens if everybody moves to the middle and all the problems come with them? Where do we find contentment? On the night before Jesus' death, so, you know, Thursday night dies on Friday, here we are on Sunday resurrection. On the night before his death, Jesus says these words to his disciples. He says, I'm leaving you peace. I'm giving you my peace. I don't give you the kind of peace that the world gives. 
So, don't be troubled or cowardly. Peace in the world is the absence of conflict. And that's the best we can come up with. So in a marriage, there are times where there's great peace because there's no arguments, there's no conflict. And between nations, there's times of peace because there's no conflict. In all kinds of relationships, in work, in other places, when you have the absence of conflict, you feel a sense of peace. It's good, but it doesn't last. Jesus says he's offering a peace that remains regardless of the conflict. I mean, for Pete's sakes, in a few hours, he's going to be hanging on a cross dying. And he's saying, I have peace. I'm content. How does that work? And he says to them, now don't, don't be troubled and, and don't act like cowards. Why would you say to somebody, don't act like a coward, unless they're about to face some stuff that's so hard in life, they're going to want to run. And he still says, I'm giving you my peace. What kind of peace is this? Where life is so hard, I might feel like running away. What kind of peace is it that requires courage? Paul helps us. He helps us a lot with this. In Philippians chapter 4, and I just want to work through this passage with you from Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. He says, never worry about anything. As some translations say, don't be anxious about anything. And let's just be honest with ourselves. Anxiety is a matter of trust and faith, isn't it? And we all face anxiety. Jesus in the Bible wouldn't say so much about anxiety if we all didn't have so much of it. So don't, so don't think, well, other people in the church don't have the anxiety that I feel. Yes, they do. To some degree or not, they feel anxious. Because we live in a very screwed up world. But he says, don't be anxious. Because it comes down to, if you can get connected with your Heavenly Father to the degree that you really trust Him and believe that He will take care of you, your anxiety level goes down. And then he says, but in every situation, let God know what you need in prayers and requests while giving thanks. Now, we, God already knows what you need. Why should I pray and tell Him what I need? Because of what it does for me. How it aligns me up. How it changes my thinking. If I spend time telling God what I need, I'm verbalizing it. I'm getting it out there. I'm revealing how I feel to God. And as you know, the revealing of your feelings is the beginning of your healings. Right? So as you verbalize it, you're getting it out to God. And that's the beginning of your healing. Verse 7. Then God's peace which goes beyond anything we can imagine, will guard your thoughts and emotions through Christ Jesus. Your thoughts? How fast does your negative self start? talk get started? Pretty fast, right? And your emotions? How quickly can your emotions fly off the handle? Pretty fast. So what do you need? A guard? You need a guard whether it's a road barrier, a do not enter sign, or a guy standing with a shield and a spear is going to give you a good poke, you know, and then you know what, to say don't go there, but you need a guard. Then God's peace, which goes beyond anything we can imagine, will guard your thoughts and emotions through Christ Jesus, relationship, importance of relationship. Finally, brothers and sisters, keep your thoughts on whatever is right and deserves praise. Things that are true, honorable, fair, pure, acceptable, or commendable. Your thoughts. So here's Jesus saying to his disciples, I'm going to give you my peace. Not as the world gives, I give you my peace. A few hours later, he's on the cross. And his thoughts are what? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Would you call that a right, pure, honorable thought I would it's in the midst of your conflict it's in the moment of that trial that, that hardship 
that you bring out those thoughts and say, I'm not going to hurt them back. I, I don't, I'm not going to hurt them. I don't care how much they want to hurt me. I choose not to. I need to be free from that vicious cycle. No. And the peace of Christ will pass all your understanding. Then in verse 9, he says, Practice what you've learned and received from me, what you heard and saw me do. Then the God who gives peace will be with you. How? When I say doing life together, that's why we do it. Because we can look across the room and we can see somebody who's been through what we're going through and we can learn from them. And if they've done it successfully, we can learn it and we can practice it in our lives. We can sit in a small group and hear somebody's story. And we go, you know what? I'm facing that at work right now. You know, and I, the way you handle that, that's just like, I would have never thought of that. I'm going to go try that. I've had people when I preached on Matthew 18, how to handle conflict. I've had business guys come up to me afterwards and say, I did that this week. It worked. We didn't even have to get to HR with that one. It was settled so fast. That Matthew 18 thing really works. But if we don't have contact with people, if we don't see somebody out there who's kind of our model, somebody that we trust, we're going to just flounder. Verse 10, the Lord has filled me with joy because you again showed interest in me. This is, he's writing to the Philippians. They sent people to encourage him. And with those people, they sent a big money gift. So he says, the Lord has filled me with joy because you again showed me interest in, interest in me. You were interested but did not have the opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in any need. Isn't it interesting he wants them to know that? We've got to help the Apostle Paul. He's in jail. He needs money. He needs encouragement. And he's saying to them, now, I want you to know that I really didn't have any need. Well, we made the trip for nothing? No. No. What he says is this lesson. He says, I've learned to be content in whatever situation I'm in. I know how to live in poverty or prosperity. No matter what the situation, I've learned the secret of how to live when I'm full or when I'm hungry, when I have too much or I have too little. What's the secret? Verse 13, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. And then he says in a very loving tone, nevertheless, it was kind of you to share in my troubles. I really appreciate it. But he wants them to know that the peace that passes understanding is found in the power of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, not in circumstances. And that's such a hard lesson for us to learn. We have such a proclivity to think that if I just have this and I just get that, I'll be content. If somebody would love me the way I need to be loved, I'd be content. If somebody would treat me the way I need to be tre treated, then I'd be content. But these circumstances are awful. That's not it. Jesus says that we should seek first God's rule. That means that his lordship in our life that he's bigger and smarter than we are, that we admit that he's God and we're not. That's what it means to seek him first. And he says, if we seek him first and his kingdom, all this other stuff that we worry about so much, it'll take care of itself. That's worship, isn't it? That's really what worship is all about. Getting that alignment, realigning. I put it like this. What we love determines what we seek. What we seek determines what we worship. What we worship determines what we think. What we think determines who we are. And what we are determines what we do. See, if you're not happy with how your life is and you've got some issues and some habits and some behaviors, you say, 
just really not happy with this, what I'm doing. The place to start is with what you're seeking. Because from seeking, you go to worship, and from worship, you go to your thinking, and from your thinking, you go to your being, and from your being, you go to your doing. If you want to make a change, change what you're seeking. Checklist. Have you made a commitment to really put Christ first in your life, to ask him to be the Lord and leader of your heart and your whole life? Have you done that? Just remember, for everybody, myself included, this is a journey towards perfection. We're not there yet. Nobody is. Nobody's perfect. But it's a journey towards perfection, and it's a process. How many times have we just learned today this key word, learn? It's a learning. Learn for me. Put it into practice. It's something that we are learning how to do. No church is perfect. If you're looking for a perfect church, good luck. You know, but every church, every church is divine. Whether it's two people or 2,000, there's something divine when Jesus Christ is there. And your commitments, they won't make you perfect. But those commitments will get you going the right direction. Let me close with Psalm 27, verse 8. You have said, God, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Let's pray. Father, as we come to the table this morning, and we think of the resurrection, this power that you raised Jesus from the dead. We think of the love expressed in Jesus and his sacrifice. We think how we are called by you and made by you from our mother's wombs. You have chosen us. And it's such an honor and a privilege to be here today. So Father, may we, as we take the bread and the cup, May we remember to seek you and seek your face, to correspond with you like those two sisters were corresponding to each other. May your love fill us. And may you fill us with your peace and joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you repeat with me our affirmation of faith? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my personal Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to the table to uh, remember your sacrifice, but we also uh, want to celebrate the resurrection and the conquering of death that you showed us. And just help us as we go into uh, this week and the rest of uh, um, the time that we have with the peace that you give us and the confidence and the, that we can have knowing that you died for us so that we could live. In your name, amen. While uh, Jesus met with his disciples, he took bread and broke it and gave it to them saying, take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and blessed it and said, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Mm 